continue our time of worship this morning with a passage from the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk. Would you stand together? And I invite you to say this passage with me. Habakkuk 3, 2. Lord, I have heard the report about you, and I fear, O Lord. Revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk 3, 2.
may be seated. <coughs> I invite you this morning to worship with us around this altar as we come together. Let's focus everything we have. Father, in some sense, though not in every sense, coming into this place and engaging in worship is a bit like trying to tune in to our favorite station signal. Back in the day, you had that tuning knob over on the right-hand side of the radio, and you would twist it until it finally hit that sweet spot where the static went away and you could hear the, the voices clearly and the music sounded as good as it was going to sound. But it was possible back in that time that uh, you had difficulty finding that station. And even today, you can be listening. I've had a lot of folk tell me, hey, Clint, I, we were going out of town Sunday and uh, I was listening to the worship service and I was able to listen to you till I got to Greenville. I was able to listen to you till I got to Paris and then I, then I lost you. Yeah, well, Lord, we lose you along the way. We get so caught up in our stuff we get so wound up in our world that we lose you and you're nothing but static your words aren't clear your presence is not all that vivid in our lives and we've lost you oh, we know you've not lost us we know you've not gone away you've not stopped being God we've it's us and I pray today as we worship, as we sing these songs, and I pray that we will listen to the message. As we open your word, may your Holy Spirit speak to you and help us to, to be tuned in, to be able to hear clearly, to be able to sense your presence vividly with us in this moment and every moment as we walk out of this place so our testimony can be Jesus is Lord. Thank you for what you're up to today, what you've begun what you will continue. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. That person may stare at you for a minute or two, and then they'll say it. You've got your daddy's ears, or you've got your mother's nose. Or they'll give some other physical attribute that they observe that you look like one of your parents that has blessed you or cursed you with one of your physical attributes. And then there are those other things. There, there are, and having been here long enough, I've, I've seen multiple generations of people come through here. And, and, and there have been times when I've heard a voice or heard a laugh and thought, ooh, one from beyond. Could close my eyes and when that person speaks, they sound exactly like their mother or sound exactly like their dad as if they have been reincarnated and come back to be with us. And then sometimes uh, this can be used in a bit of a derogatory fashion when somebody will make an observation. You know, the older you get, the more you act like your daddy. That's rarely a compliment. That's usually a, a slam in some way. But it's an acknowledgement that, that we are affected by, influenced by, uh, a bit molded and shaped by those who have given us life we are a spitting image, if you will. We are a reflection of the mom or the dad figure in our life. Paul got to this part of the text, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the first three verses. Now, those of you who've been keeping score and know where we are as we're making our way through 1 Corinthians, some of you might have been getting more excited about the fact, oh, we're about to get to the discussion of the spiritual gifts. That's good because I, I've been wanting to know better what my gift is and what Paul might have said to the church at Corinth about spiritual gifts. Well, we're going to get there, but we're not quite there. Because in the first three verses of the 12th chapter, there's a bit of a, a prelude, I think, to what comes after as he begins to really open up more of a conversation about spiritual gifts. He, he, I believe, opens up that part of the conversation by reminding us that, that we are the image of our Father. We are the spitting image, if you will, of our spiritual Father. And, and he does that in these three verses, and, and I, I hope this morning that as you listen, uh, you will be able to, to get it. You will be able to make application in your life, take it home with you, and see what the Lord wants to do with this in your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, Paul writing to the church at Corinth said, Now, concerning spiritual gifts. And then again, he specifies who he's talking to, my family, brethren. I don't want you to be unaware. Again, this is Paul's formula. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, we're moving on to another question. We're moving on to another subject. We've kind of finished up that last one that we were discussing. It's now time to open up another envelope and see what the next question is. And let's, let's talk about, well, let's talk about spiritual gifts for a little while. In most of our English text, the word gift is in italics. And, and I think the editors plug that in because it makes it fit with what comes after. But if, if that word weren't there, if we just took it with now, now, Concerning spirituality, concerning the spiritual. I don't want you to be out in left field. I don't want you to be unaware of what God is up to. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is accursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. This is a bit of a scriptural connective tissue tying in where we were to where we're headed. And, and in these three verses, giving us a, a pretty meaty nugget here that will help us as we make our way through the remaining part of, of 1 Corinthians. It, it reminds us of three things. It teaches us three things about ourselves and, and about how we are created to connect to God, to know God. And he begins with this simple assertion, yet complex assertion. We are spiritual beings. We, all of us, are spiritual beings. This Corinthian congregation, man, was an interesting congregation. People came from many different walks of life, many different uh, ethnic backgrounds, many different spiritual experiences, and they were all thrown together. There was only one thing that tied them together, their faith in Jesus Christ. 
but they couldn't escape where they'd come from. They couldn't leave behind entirely their baggage. And from time to time, it just kind of got unpacked and it got in the way of what the Lord was trying to do. And, and one of those areas, I believe, was, was as they would begin to talk about what it meant to be a spiritual person. What does it mean to connect to a, a deity, a God, somewhere out there beyond us? How do we express our spirituality? Many of those who had come to faith in Christ and were a part of this Corinthian congregation had been influenced by the, the Greek mystery religions. And in those religions... A great deal of value and emphasis was placed on experiences. They looked for them. They yearned for them. They wanted to have them because it was an indication, as far as they could tell, an indication of how close you were to your God, to your deity. So there were some wackadoodle things that went on outside of and apparently were encroaching on the fellowship of the church. Paul knew that more and more this would creep into the fellowship, and so he addresses the issue, meeting it head on. Now concerning spiritual gifts, concerning the, the presence of the spiritual, the manifestation of the spiritual among you, I, I really don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be unaware about who we are in Jesus Christ. And there was absolutely no question in his mind but that these folk who were gathered together, just as those of us who were gathered together in this room this morning, we are all, from the youngest to the eldest, from the back to the front, we are all spiritual beings. There's nobody that's left out. There's nobody that's disqualified. We are all spiritual beings. And I, I say that not because I'm a philosopher, not because I've come to that conclusion. I say that because God's Word teaches us that. In fact, from the very first pages of the Bible, in the book of Genesis chapter 1, in verse 26, the Word records for us, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. There it is, three words, in our image. Now use your imagination. It's what I have to do, and it's what you must do. What was that process like? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, collaborating together together. In creation. It wasn't that the Son and the Spirit were a part of the creative process. They were already there. Let us make man in our image. And so they huddled around and, and they began to scoop up some dirt and fashion a form there laying on the ground. Was it that they had a mirror? And they were holding up the mirror to the three of them and, and they said, let us make man in our image. You would have heard things like, the nose is too big. The ears are out of proportion. He's too short. He, he lacks expression. And, and they would have put together all of their input and, and then come up with a perfect being, man, created in the image of God. And when they were finished, they would have stepped back and looked at that physical presence and said, ah, this is good. I don't think so. Number one, I don't think they needed a mirror. Number two, I don't think that's how the conversation went at all, though we are lacking that conversation. It simply says that God said together, the Godhead, let us make man in our image. And so in verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them both in the image of God. What does that mean to be created in God's image? If it doesn't mean a physical likeness, what does it mean? Is it something that's afforded only to those who have professed faith, only to those who've joined the team? No, there's no indication that that's the case at all. The indication is that all of humanity, all of mankind, all of that created order of humanity is created in the image of God. We get a hint of the why we believe that a little later on as God gives the children of Israel, some guidelines, if you will. We can call them laws, commandments, rules. God gives them some guidelines that, that will help them order their life and help them understand better who He is. It begins with, you shall have no other gods before me. I mean, that was, that was critical. He wanted them to know that He was the one true God. But then later on, He said to them, thou shalt not commit murder. Why? Because... All those folk out there, some of those that you're going to get angry with, some of those that you are going to ponder that you want to kill, I need you to remember this. He, she was created in my image. Don't ever forget that. Don't, don't let that, that escape you. In my image. So then, 
What does it mean? There's several statements that we could make that would feed into that. To be created in the image of God means that, that we are created with the capacity, the ability to know God. Unlike any other part of the created order, we, we have been created with the capacity, the ability to know God. It's in there, hardwired, a part of our, our created person. Millard Erickson wrote in his Christian theology, the image is the powers of personality that make humans, like God, beings capable of interacting with other persons, conversation, understanding, relating, the ability to know and to be known. It, it, is, it is that ability to think and reflect because God gave us a brain. We've all got a brain. Now, they're either different in capacity or different in use because we're not all alike in our brain product. But we all have one, and, and we have the ability to take in information, to reflect on it, to, to digest it, and then to choose based on what we understand after having reflected that choice is the third part of that. We are free moral agents. We, we are able to act volitionally as we understand, as we relate, we then choose, we act on those things that we understand. So we are spiritual beings created by God, designed by God with the ability to know Him. Not just to know that He is, not just to say, I believe in God, I believe there's a God out there somewhere, but to be able to have an intimate relationship, a fellowship with God. And we Whether we acknowledge it or not, uh, whether we will act on it or not, we have a desire to connect with someone, something that is above us and beyond us. There is that realization. It may come in fleeting moments. It may come and set in. There is that realization that there's more, there's more to this than just me. We are spiritual beings. But then he hastened to remind them about the influences that many of them had already experienced. He hastened to remind them that it doesn't always have a fairy tale ending. They didn't always live happily ever after. Sometimes in, in that desire to express our spirituality, in our pursuit of being a spiritual being, we, are, we can be duped by very poor substitutes. That's the point he made in verse 2. You know that, that when you were pagans, that's a harsh word. I get that. I mean, you wouldn't like for me to refer to you as the unwashed horde of pagans this morning. You wouldn't like for me to point out any of you and call you a bunch of heathens. That's an offensive word. You're here anyway. You're, you're in church. The heathens are the ones who are not here, right? The pagans are the ones who never go to church, right? You don't have to answer that. But he said to them, you know that when you were pagans, before you came to know Christ, before you experienced a life change that, that gave you a, a new meaning and a new purpose, before any of that took place, you were, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led, led astray. In his commentary on 1 Corinthians, David Pryor observed this, about us in the Western world of the late 20th century, early 21st century, as increasing disillusionment with technology and materialism eats into most people, and certainly in virtually every non-Western culture, there is a plethora of religions and a multitude of spiritual experiences which are real, but which, because of their very diversity and popularity, we need to evaluate properly with adequate criteria. And here are the criteria, the questions that he would encourage us to ask. One, what comes from God? How much of this is, is genuinely a person or a group of people seeking to connect with God, seeking to meet God, seeking to express their relationship with God? A second question he would ask, how much of it is the result of a disturbed personality or psychological trauma? not to be made light of, not to, to laugh at, but it, it is truth. We read the stories from time to time about the person who's running down the street with a weapon and he's stopped by the police and, and they ask him what he's doing and his answer is, God told me to kill so-and-so. He fills in the blank. God told me to, and, and, and then God becomes the reason behind, the impetus behind some uh, antisocial destructive behavior 
that would result in them being arrested. But another expression of spirituality, if you will. Another question, what happens to us in certain drug-induced states, whether under medical supervision or in certain unrestricted subcultures? What is, the, what is the direct inspiration of Satan himself and his forces at work in our life? Uh, so Pryor's questions there uh, point us to the, to the reality that that search for spiritual connection and fulfillment can take many different forms, a lot of different forms. Uh, for one, uh, there are those people who are just looking for an experience. And there's an insatiable appetite for an experience of some kind. High energy, highly emotional, cathartic experiences that produce a temporary high. I get that, okay? I get that. I, I, taught, I described this as a quasi-competition in that church in Corinth and where one group would say, well, our experience is better than your, your experience. We're more spiritual than you. And we hadn't had any of those kind of outbreaks where people were doing wackadoodle things in the church yet, but there have been other expressions of that. We're more spiritual than you. Yeah, we're closer to God than you. In fact, in, in our churches in recent days, it's, it's taken more of a form of preference and worship style than ecstatic experiences. Uh, folks kind of square off over one service or the other, and, and in some places, not here by our choice. In some places, there are worship services. The 930 is one flavor and the 1045 is another flavor. And the older folk primarily may be in one service and you go to that service and, and you've, got a, you've got a piano and an organ. And they would say those were the two instruments that were ordained by God. There's a piano and an organ and all the songs are sung out of the hymn book because we know if God had intended for them to be sung, they would have been in the hymn book in the first place. And, and so they, they sing together. The pastor looks a lot like this. You know, he's got on his suit with his tie and, and then he's up there preaching and, and, uh, and they, sing, they sing the invitation, the doxology, and then they go home and they say, we have been close to God. There's another group of people who look at that service and say, you are a bunch of dead people. That is the most boring thing I've ever seen in my life. We want a little life. We want a little life. And so you look up there in that service and you got the drums and you got the guitars and you got the piano and you got the rest of the orchestra and we are getting down with our bad self. We got a good beat. We're singing songs that are not in the hymn book. We're reading words off the wall because we all know reading words off the wall is more spiritual than reading words out of a book. And so we are, we are doing that. And, and oh, by the way, and there's a great deal of pressure on the preacher as well. And if I, if I were going to be hip and, and preach in that kind of service, I would have to at least take my coat off. You know, I, I realize that because a coat is stuffy and stodgy, right? And if I really wanted to connect with the young people, I would just, I'd have to let my, let my suspenders just kind of <laughs> flap in the breeze. Because we all know you can't be filled with the Spirit when you're bound up by a pair of suspenders. And that's as much as I'm going to take off. I'm, I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> and then you get this yan yan going on with one saying, well, we're more spiritual than you. No, we're more spiritual than you. We're closer to God. No, we're closer to God. And, and it ends up being an unnecessary and a fruitless fight between two groups of people who really ought to be seeking the same thing, to worship the one true God. Okay? So that's where, where Paul was. That's why I don't do that while I preach, because you get your straps all twisted up and Put you in a bind. Some of y'all know about that. It's just a terrible thing. <laughs> but there are those who look for spirituality and experiences. There are those who pursue it through drugs, liquid drugs, legal drugs, illegal drugs, and escape. The normal avenues haven't worked. The normal pursuits have been unsuccessful and unfulfilling. I want relief. I want release. I want something that will help me get outside of my head, something that will help me get beyond myself and experience something that will, at least for a moment, make me feel more alive. And whatever drug culture out there, whatever libation that one may choose, may afford that experience, though temporarily. Some conclude they'll never find it alone, whatever it is they're looking for. And so they are drawn to groups, cult groups. Sometimes they're led by a famous personality, a David Koresh, 
a Jim Jones, a preacher type who has drawn followers, adherence to himself, and has prescribed the way to experience that life that they're looking for. And if not that cult, I'm afraid that many of us pursue the cult of self, where there, there is a, an expressed need to be religious, but the religion doesn't scratch the itch of spirituality. There's got to be more. There, there's got to be more. I mean, you're sitting in here on Sunday morning. I mean, it's 1131, and, and it's time change weekend. It's the opening weekend of spring break. It's 1131, and, and many of you who know how this deal works, you know i got 14 more minutes before my time expires. And so you're hoping, dear God, help me to hold on for 14 more minutes. And please notice, please, please make a mark on my permanent record that I showed up for church on time change and the opening weekend of spring break. And dear God, please let me get some credit for that because that's about all I'm going to get out of this. Some of you are trying to hold on to the bitter end and, and you're thinking, I haven't understood a word he said yet and I don't have any hope that I will till he, when he gets finished. Let me, just, let me just endure. If only things were more exciting. Well, I feel the same way sometimes. I mean, it's, sometimes preaching to you is like preaching to a tree full of owls. I mean, just... And, and I, I wish, you know, I wish for something more. And you say, well, what would you like? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily look for somebody to roll down the aisles, though that would be exciting. We've had that, by the way. A child or two back in the day got loose from their caretakers and rolled down the aisle. It didn't spark revival. Maybe swinging from the chandeliers, we got none. Here we had some downtown. Nobody could reach them. Maybe if somebody would just get fired up and stand up and began to give a testimony. But then I, I don't like that because that would interrupt my time. What would, we, what would we be looking for? Just something. Something. Behind all of these poor substitutes is the seduction and deception of Satan because he knows. Long before you and I went to Sunday school, long before you and I ever went to the church the first time and began to read God's Word, Satan already knew he was way ahead of us. He'd read the book. In fact, he knew God. Had been kicked out of heaven by him offended by God. And after he got kicked out, he, he was a one-man band that gathered some others to join with him. And their sole purpose was to get in the way of God and disrupt his purposes. So if you got people out there that are created in the image of God with the capacity to know God and, and with a desire in there to relate to God, the best thing you can do is throw stuff at them and fill up their life and that void in their life with junk. Some of it shiny, flashy. Some of it that just gives you a buzz temporarily. Some of it that keeps you busy so long that you forget about God even being there. But he throws stuff at you to fill that void, to scratch that itch, that desire to connect with something, someone beyond yourself, and it keeps you from God. And Paul said, be careful about those cheap substitutes that are out there that threaten to rob you of the best that God has for you. And then he gets to that last verse, verse 3, and that last point of our message this morning is we can trust the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, he said, I, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is accursed Jesus is Lord. Diametrically opposed statements. And I don't know that Paul was suggesting that maybe somebody had stood up already in church and had made that declaration, Jesus is accursed. That would seem terribly out of place to me. Although, when somebody gets caught up in some kind of ecstatic experience, some kind of moment, there's no telling what they might say in that moment. They might have said that, though I doubt it, but his, his point was clear. Nobody, nobody who is being led by. Nobody who is, is filled with God's presence in the Holy Spirit is going to take the opposing team's view. Jesus is accursed because that's a denial of God. It's a denial of, of the lordship of Jesus Christ, and that's not the way the Spirit leads people. You see, it's only by the Holy Spirit that any of us can hail Christ as Lord. Now, Somebody could mockingly say, Jesus is Lord. We know that. It, it happens all the time. Paul would not deny that either. But he's saying that those words, Jesus is Lord, can be uttered with full meaning only under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Then he makes this statement. And I want you to think about for this, this for just a moment as we're winding up. The Lordship of Christ 
is not a human discovery. It's a discovery that is made and can be made only when the Spirit is at work in the heart. I was convicted when I read that statement for this reason. I can't tell you the number of times when I've stood up in front of you and in other churches with other people and encouraged you along the way, make Jesus Lord of your life. Make Jesus Lord of your life as if that was a step you'd not taken, that was something that you'd not done yet. You've been too busy with other things to, to make Jesus Lord of your life. Therefore, you are an inferior spiritual being. And so today, if you really want to get on the way with God, then you need to raise your hand, sign up, and say, I, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. And it hit me as I read the passage, and I read that statement in that commentary, I, nor you, have the capacity to make Jesus Lord of anything. He's God's son. He put on flesh and dwelt among us. He showed us who God was. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He was so committed to that mission that he followed it all the way to Calvary's cross. He could have wiped out the whole mess of them. And he let them nail him to a crude wooden cross piece. He let them press a crown of thorns on his head. He let them spit on him and hit him with their fists. because that was God's plan, and he was committed to the will of the Father who sent him. He died, physically died. They carried his lifeless body and laid it in the tomb, a borrowed tomb. It belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. And he laid there from Friday evening until Sunday morning when they came to finish the burial process, and he was no longer there. And they discovered in increasing numbers that he wasn't in the grave. He was very much alive. He, the one who had been nailed to the cross and who had died on that cross and been placed in that tomb, he was very much alive. And they saw him and they listened to him. They observed him. Forty days later, as they were walking along, he ascends into heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father. So the one who was in heaven put on flesh, came and dwelled among us, and willingly followed that commission of God all the way to the cross. He, the one who ascended back into heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father, he doesn't need to be made Lord. He already is Lord. He already is Lord. You say, well, Clint, that's a semantics thing. Oh, really? It's not at all. Because we, we make it sound as if making Jesus Lord is our job. It's something that we accomplish along the way. No, he's already a Lord. It, it is that we recognize that it's only as I submit, I give myself to Christ in humble faith and trust Him to forgive me of my sin and to pour into me His eternal life. And with that, the presence, not of a facsimile of God, a sample of God, a small portion of God, but He pours into me the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God. And as God's Spirit works in me to teach me, to shape me, to mold me, to use me in a way that will be God-pleasing, I discover more and more Jesus is Lord. And I can see it in me. For we are created in the image of God. Now, we're about to wind up. And if you've made it through this morning, you might have sat here and you might have thought, so confusing, Clint. Well, I hope not. You may be trying a lot of different things, a lot of different substitutes to give you a buzz, to get you through the day, to help you survive, to make you feel like your life is worth living. And I, I'm telling you, Satan is going to keep throwing stuff at you until you get tired because he's never going to get tired. You can keep trying, but it's all going to frustrate you because none of it works. It'll only be when you come in faith to Jesus Christ and humbly like a child say, I can't, but you can. I've not been able to, but you are able through Christ to forgive me, to cleanse me, to give me a new start. And then you can experience that life in Christ. You may be here as a believer today and you'd say, Clint, woo, I took a wrong turn a few, few days ago and I, I've been chasing some things, trying to create something myself, trying to, to manufacture something and it's not working. I'm frustrated. I've contemplated going here and doing this and trying this and trying that just because I'm, I'm frustrated. Yeah, I get it. And the more we take the things of God into our tawdry little hands, the more frustrating it becomes. It's only when we come back and say, okay, God, man, you've done a great work in me. You are Lord, and I want you. 
to use me and let God do what only God is able to do. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for gathering us together this morning, for reminding us of your love for us and the opportunity to have spiritual life through you. Thank you, Father, for creating us with the capacity to know you and for your willingness to reach out to us to consummate that relationship. We give this invitation to you, asking God that that your desire, your will, would be accomplished in us today as we submit to you, as we give ourselves to you. We ask this in Jesus' powerful name, the precious name. Amen.